Is it wrong for me to tell you, hey, go ahead and ignore these potentially solid Disney World tips and tricks? Right now you might be saying, uh, yeah, of course it's wrong, AJ, but by the end of this video, I expect y'all to be singing a different tune. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. As it turns out, not all Disney World advice has that one size fits all situation. So I'm gonna talk about how some of the most popular tips and tricks that we've told you to do can backfire on you in the worst possible ways. And we're gonna tell you some alternative tips you can use instead. That's right, Disney World tips are not fail proof. And we're gonna talk about when today. First piece of great Disney World advice that we're gonna punch holes in today is getting a park hopper. I think I have a park hop till you drop shirt bunched up in my closet somewhere, and that's because I'm not against park hopping. Park hopping's great, especially if you only have a couple days to spend in Disney World and you wanna see as much of the most magical place on earth as possible. Now, for those of you who aren't sure what park hopping is, that is when you go to one Disney World theme park in the morning and hop to another Disney World theme park in the afternoon instead of staying in the same park all day. Now, park hoppers are a ticket add-on and they are more costly than just your average single day ticket. The starting average price of a single day ticket is around $109. And if you add park hopper capabilities, you'll be paying an additional $65 on top of each ticket price. If you're spending enough days in Disney World and you feel that you can comfortably visit all four parks, giving each its own day, then you can skip this extra cost and save a good chunk of money. You can always add a park hopper later if you're wanting to double up on your park Park days. Just go to the My Disney Experience app, tap on the Tickets and Passes tab, choose the ticket you're wanting to upgrade, and select the Change Ticket option. Or you can swing by Guest Relations before you enter the parks and have a cast member add on the Park Hopper for you. So yeah, you don't have to decide about your Park Hopper before you get to Disney World. You can add it on any day that you're in the parks. Just keep in mind that Park Hoppers might tempt you to hit that Disney day from dawn until midnight to get your money's worth. There's something to be said for getting back to your hotel room a little early and getting some rest after hitting up a park very early or sleeping in on a day you plan on staying in a park late. It's all about quality versus quantity around here. Also, keep in mind that park hopping doesn't just mean jumping immediately from one park to the next whenever you want. That's how it used to be, that's not how it is anymore. First off, you've gotta start your day at the park you made your park pass reservation for. And secondly, you won't be able to jump to the next park until after 2 p.m. rolls around. And third, the parks aren't just across the way from each other like they are at Disneyland. You can literally walk from Disneyland to Disney California Adventure in no time at all, which is super nice. But Disney World is huge and you're gonna have to hop in your car or onto Disney World transportation to get from point A to point B, which is gonna take a chunk out of your day. So if you do wind up with park hoppers, consider hopping from parks that are closer to each other instead of farther away. Disney's Hollywood Studios and Epcot are connected by the Skyliner route, so park hopping shouldn't be as much of a hassle there. Whereas if you're hopping from Magic Kingdom to like Animal Kingdom, that's gonna be a long bus ride or a long car ride. You're gonna have to take the monorail or ferry to your car, and then you're gonna have to get all the way over to Animal Kingdom. So that takes extra time out of that park hopper purchase of yours. Okay, next tip you need to ignore sometimes, or at least be careful with, is buying used pins online before you go to do your pin trading. Disney pins are a fun, kind of affordable souvenir that we consider to be the gift that keeps on giving the whole year and then some. Now, if you see a pin board out in the wild throughout the parks, you can trade any of your official Disney pins for a pin on one of those boards. Now, a starter pin lanyard with about four to six pins is gonna cost you around 20 to $30, depending on the set. In order to save money, you might hear it recommended down the grapevine that you should purchase a bulk set of starter pins online from a site like eBay or Amazon. And initially, that's gonna look like a pretty great deal. Sometimes you can get up to 50 or even 100 Disney pins for 20 to $30. So what's the catch, right? There's gotta be a catch. Yeah, there's totally a catch. Many times when you purchase pins from a third party, you're gonna receive pins that are known in the trading community as scrapper pins. Scrapper pins are gonna look extremely similar to the original ones, but the quality is much cheaper. Instead of having nice smooth edges, those pins will have more jagged ones. The coloring can also be dulled or blotchy. Sometimes the pins will have major design mistakes where characters are missing an eye or their faces are a weird shade of green. You might also find these flawed pins around the Orlando gift shops outside the Disney bubble. What makes these scrapper pins so much worse is that many times cast members don't have the time to study each and every pin to make sure they're not scrappers. So many of these third-party pins end up on the boards around the parks, meaning you could end up trading one of your really nice pins for a pin of much lesser quality without realizing it. 
It's frustrating to purchase really nice Disney pins only to find that anytime you want to make a trade, the Disney World board's oversaturated with these fake pins. If you're looking to purchase some nice official Disney traders for a cheaper price to help prevent flooding the Disney World pin boards with scrappers, consider checking out ShopDisney.com. The Shop Disney website will usually have a limited selection of starter packs available to buy, and if you hit up the website at the right time, you can order these pins at a discounted price. Discounted pins can also be found at your local Disney outlet or at the character warehouse stores in the Orlando area where Disney World's overstock merch is sold. Now, if you do buy pins online from these eBay or Amazon websites, you've got to figure out how to make sure they are legit, they are authentic. Nobody wants to perpetuate these scrapper pins, these fake pins that people make, basically they're counterfeit. Okay, the next one is using your early theme park entry or rope dropping the most popular rides. If you're planning on staying at a Disney World resort or Good Neighbor Hotel during your upcoming vacation, then you'll be receiving this nice little perk called early theme park entry. That allows guests to enter any of the four parks 30 minutes before their official opening times, as long as they have a park pass for that park. In 30 minutes, there's so much to do in so little time, so what are you going to do? Lots of people use this opportunity to jump into queue lines for top tier attractions like Hollywood Studios, Rise of the Resistance, or Epcot's Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. And on paper, that sounds great, especially since these rides can rack up intense wait times later in the day. But this isn't a foolproof concept. Though using your extra 30 minutes could still help you cut down on your overall wait time, that doesn't mean you won't still wind up waiting an hour or so for the most popular attractions. So let's think about this. Instead of immediately using your extra 30 minutes to book it to the hottest ride, consider these two other options instead. Option one, hit up the less popular rides. Sure, you can get in line for the already extensive Seven Dwarfs Mine Train with your extra 30 minutes, but you can also go to several rides in a row with little to no wait, like Jungle Cruise, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion. Even the less popular attractions can rack up long wait times midday. So this is still a great way to knock out at least a couple of rides in a short amount of time. Option two, hit the snooze button. Just because you have the early theme park hours benefit doesn't mean you have to use it. To help alleviate theme park burnout or to just give your body a chance to take a breather from the constant 20,000 plus steps you've been taking daily, it may be way more beneficial for you and your group to catch some extra Z's before getting up and at them for another Disney-fied day. The next tip that you might want to ignore, go back to your hotel room for an afternoon nap. This isn't just advice given to the little ones, it's also advice for all of us who need a second wind when they're starting to feel hot, cranky, and flat out exhausted come mid-afternoon. Even if escaping to dreamland for a bit may sound appealing, don't board a shuttle back to your hotel just yet. First, think about where you're staying on property. How long does it take you to get to and from the parks? Sure, if you're staying at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge and you're currently at Disney's Animal Kingdom, then heading back to your hotel might not be as big of a deal. But if you're staying at AKL and you're traveling back from Magic Kingdom, then you've got to get out of the park to your car or to a bus. You've got to wait for the bus. And then you're traveling like 20 to 30 minutes back to the hotel. That's not even factoring the time it takes you to walk from the hotel's lobby to your room, which could be extensive. In total, this quick midday nap could wind up taking a much bigger chunk out of your park day than you might have wanted to take. Believe me, this is an experience I have all the time. I am very, very bad at time management. And when I say that I'm going to leave Magic Kingdom, head back to my hotel for a nap, and then meet somebody in the park at like three o'clock, I am always late and I always realize is by the time I get back to my room, decompress a little bit, actually get in the mind frame to take a nap after being in the park all morning, and then I try to get someplace else in time to meet the person I said I would meet, it never works out. So that midday nap, that's not just going to be like an hour out of your day. That's going to probably be like four hours out of your day. I'm just being honest. So sometimes that's great. You go, you swim in the pool a little bit, you relax, and then you go to dinner, right? But if you're like, no, no, I'm going to be at Magic Kingdom until two, then I'm just going to pop back to Port Orleans Riverside, take a nap, and then I can be at Epcot by three. Absolutely not. You super, super can't. So be prepared for that whole little midday rest situation to be like three or four hours, which time is money in Disney World, and you guys get it. Now, if you have kids and they need their naps, then I absolutely say go ahead and do it. Build in that time to your trip. Understand that you're going to kind of have a three to four hour space in each day that you've got to get back to the hotel. Everybody's got to get fed. You take naps. 
That's really important for those kids to stay on their schedules, trust me. But if you don't have nappers, or if you're lucky enough to have a napper who will fall asleep at 2 p.m. no matter what anywhere, and you really don't wanna feel the FOMO during a Disney park day, then try to find times during the day to rest in the parks. Go to shows, make reservations for a restaurant so you can just sit down to eat, or locate quiet areas that take you away from the crowds. Just find time to relax a little bit, decompress. I know it's easier said than done, but it is possible. Now remember, a lot of restaurants will not let you bring your stroller into the restaurant. So if you do have a napper who falls asleep at 2 p.m. no matter what, and you're gonna take that time and go to dinner or lunch, then it's rare that a restaurant's gonna let you bring a stroller in with a napping baby. Sometimes it happens, but sometimes you're gonna have to wake that baby up, take that baby out of the stroller. So just heads up on that. All right, next great tip that you sometimes need to be careful about is that whole Aunt Susan thing. You can't miss this. You have to do this. All these people in your life who are telling you that you will totally lose at your Disney World trip if you don't do X thing. People are going to want to help you build your itinerary with their favorite rides and their favorite restaurants and hotels in mind. And frankly, a lot of their favorites are just the ones they went to. Like they haven't been to everywhere. <laughs> so they're just like, oh, I happened to go to Pizza Safari. And so Pizza Safari is the best restaurant. Well, they have good intentions, but they're wrong. So here's the thing. It's not the law to ride every ride your cousin Jimmy says he loved. And it's not the law to go to every restaurant Aunt Susan enjoyed. If you don't want to go, don't go. That's why you're here. That's why you listen to us. That's why you watch these videos is so you can listen to someone who's been to every single restaurant and every single hotel and on every single ride multiple times. And we can give you the real story on those things. But I gotta be honest, if there's something I love that you know is not for you, if I love plastic cheese and you're like, dude, I am not a dairy person. Cool. Don't get it. Same with the rides. We can tell you Rise of the Resistance over at Hollywood Studios is the hottest attraction right now. But if you get really bad motion sickness or you know you're gonna be in a sour mood after having to wait in line for a couple of hours just to ride it, or you're just not the world's biggest Star Wars fan, then skip it. Disney vacations don't have to take on a cookie cutter mold. You don't have to do everything that your Facebook group tells you you have to do. That's why we try to give you that array of suggestions here. We wanna give you a bunch of options. We wanna make sure you know how you match up best with some of these rides and restaurants. That's our job here. And then you get the freedom to plan your schedule with your preferences. So remember to take any and all suggestions that you receive with a grain of salt, but do your own research. Watch point of view ride throughs of rides on YouTube. Allears.net has a lot of really, really good ones. And then you can make sure that those are gonna be something your kids are gonna to wanna to experience that you're gonna to wanna to do. Study up on various Disney World menus to see if there'll be something you wanna order at the places you're considering. Play around with the My Disney Experience app and find add-ons that will work best for you and your travel party. At the end of the day, this is a list for you, not for anybody else, not for Aunt Susan, not for Cousin Jimmy, for you. Next super popular tip that kind of can backfire is don't get caught without rain gear. I'm not even joking. You know one of the things I miss most about Disney's Hollywood Studios defunct attraction, The Great Movie Ride? It was that one scene where the Gene Kelly animatronic was hanging off the lamppost and he's singing in the rain and it just made it look really pleasant to be caught in a storm. And when you're in Orlando, well, you kind of need that reminder that you can still have a really good time in the parks when you're caught in a storm. And that's why we always tell you, be prepared for rain. It's probably gonna rain while you're there. And Orlando is notorious for those like 30% chance of rain days ending up being total rain outs. But when you're not seeing rain in the forecast, that generally means that if it does rain, it won't rain all day long. Like if the rain forecast is 0%, it's probably not gonna rain. And if it does, it's just gonna rain for a tiny bit. And it can be a huge hassle to haul around ponchos, extra shoes, extra socks, umbrellas, and other dry clothes for your entire crew for a few minutes of afternoon showers. So yeah, we always tell you to bring your rain gear because if it rains a lot, you're probably gonna end up spending way too much on ponchos and umbrellas in the parks. But if there's a 0% chance of rain or you're going during a time of year that Orlando just doesn't see very much rain, then you don't wanna be hauling around huge backpacks full of ponchos all day long when you're not gonna need them. So here's some planning tips. If you don't wanna walk around soggy all day, invest in some quick dry shorts and shirts before your trip. You can find those quick dry clothes at a lot of athletic wear stores and 
Amazon. But if you also want to invest in shoes that are comfortable without socks, so you don't have to worry about wearing those soaked socks, they're the worst and they get you big blisters, then choose some of those Tevas or Crocs or things that dry really quickly. Just don't forget to break in those shoes before you get to the parks. No matter the brand, new shoes are still new shoes, so you need to wear them for a couple of weeks to prevent them from blistering your heels or rubbing your feet raw. Been there, done that, did it like last week. So I never learned my lesson. Otherwise, when you know a rainstorm is approaching, duck into a nearby gift shop, show, restaurant, or indoor queue for a spell, because not everything at the Disney parks happens outside. So take the opportunity to explore some of the options inside the numerous Disney buildings as you're waiting for the storm to pass. Or don't. A little rain never hurt anyone. You'll dry. Okay, next, usually good tip that isn't so great anymore is don't worry about planning ahead for fast food meals. On a normal day outside the Disney parks, you might think, man, I'm hungry. I should drive through, insert favorite drive through restaurant for lunch. And then you do and you order and then you pick up your food and then the whole interaction might take five-ish minutes on a good day. But Disney World is different. Though quick service or counter service or fast food, they're all the same. Locations at Disney World don't have the whole advanced dining reservation thing to stress over like you do for the table and signature restaurants. It's still a good idea to plan ahead for which fast food you wanna eat while you're at the parks. For starters, lots of fast food locations around Disney World still rely on mobile order only. You'll have to order your food on the My Disney Experience app. Though the app or a nearby cast member can walk you through this process, you may find that your projected return time isn't exactly what you were hoping for, particularly if you're trying to order a meal during a fast food's peak lunch or dinner hours, or if you want your food like right now. If it's busy enough, the soonest time you might be able to pick up your food could wind up being an hour later or more than you were expecting. And what if you are able to grab a meal fairly quickly during those peak dining times? Well, that's great, except for the fact that finding seating can be extremely limited come lunch and dinner, especially with the crowds that are in the parks right now. So you might be stuck with a full tray of food and literally no place to sit. I can't tell you how many times I see people sitting on the ground at Disney World fast food locations eating their food. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be those people. Now, instead of leaving your quick service dining up to chance, plan to eat either a later lunch or an earlier dinner so you can avoid that hungry wave of park goers. Get a snack for now or eat a bigger breakfast. Hold yourself over while you wait for the dining crowds to die down or bring your snacks with you. We always give that recommendation. Just put them in your fanny pack or whatever and snack throughout the day. Or you can always book that mobile order time early. And what I mean by early is get on at 9 a.m. and book your lunch for 11 a.m. That way you're avoiding peak times to eat you're gonna find a seat and you'll get lunch out of the way quickly. So we've got a handful of videos that discuss some of our favorite, less expensive eats around the park that'll help you decide what food you're gonna like the best. But I wanna say right now, there is counter service fast food in Disney World that is no good. So I want you to know the best places to eat. That's why I'm here. That's why I get up in the morning. It breaks my heart when I see a bunch of people standing in outside lines in 90 degree heat at a fast food restaurant that I know has bad food. So my heart is happy when you don't wait in long lines, you find a good air conditioned place to sit and you love, love, love the fast food that you're eating in Disney World. Cause there's a lot of good stuff. Satuli Canteen in Disney's Animal Kingdom, Ronto Roasters, Columbia Harbor House in Magic Kingdom, Regal Eagle in Epcot, all good stuff but there are so many more out there for you to uncover and I don't want you to just walk up to the first place that has hockey puck burgers or puffy pizza in Disney World and waste your money and your time on that. So check out where the good quick service food is to avoid settling for those substandard eats. We've got a DFB guide to Walt Disney World Dining that has all of this information in it for you. We talk about every single restaurant. We have tons of recommendations. And this is from like 20 years combined, more than that probably. We're probably with all of our team members, I don't know, 100 years combined. It feels like we all know Disney World pretty well by now. So we always wanna give you an authentic idea of what you can expect for each restaurant. That's what we do in that guidebook. You can get it over at dfbstore.com. And don't forget to use code YouTube for a discount. It is a 100% money back guarantee book. So if you don't like it, you don't have to keep it. Okay, so there are a few really great Disney World tips that can sometimes backfire at the most inopportune times. So keep in mind that not every tip is going to work with you and your particular trip variables, your particular group, or your particular situation. So do your research, stay vigilant, and oh, I don't know, keep coming back here for a variety of tips and tricks. We work so hard to cover a large scope for you Disney travelers out there. We want to make sure you have the best trip possible that's why we're here. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.